Welcome to the Practice X Factor, the place to be for mastering membership plans for your business. Here, you'll learn exactly how to grow your patient relationships and accelerate your profits without getting stuck on the dental insurance bandwagon. It's great to be back with you, sharing something that I'm passionate about and something that I'm really energized about helping other practice owners implement into their practice so that we can maintain autonomy and the great opportunity we have in our profession to have a great quality of life, but also help a lot of people with really one of the most meaningful services. Uh, in some ways, it could be the most meaningful service that you can provide anyone. And I think dentistry is uh, such a great value as far as bang for the buck, you know, some people see going to the dentist as being expensive, which there is a significant amount of money invested sometimes. But when you compare it to other things like cars that generally people only drive for two to five years and then they have to buy another car again, or even a lot of other types of healthcare expenses, dentistry is very effective as far as how far your dollar goes. Now, obviously there are some differences with things like um, financing for cars is much more prevalent, even though it is growing in dentistry and health insurance or medical insurance, which is really more of a true form insurance than dental insurance covers a lot more things than dental does. And so the way that it's paid for is different, but as far as just comparing cost dollars to dollars. I think it's a great value. So we'll talk some more about that in today's episode. We'll talk about how to screen out right fit versus wrong fit patients and how to do it the right way and the four horsemen of when to refer. And um, I have a tool that if you'd like a copy of, um, we call it the pre-qualifier positioner. It's a, a great exercise to go through with your team to be able to filter out who's your ideal patient and who's not and do it in the right way so that you're not judging or you're not uh, screening too quickly or without giving people a chance because especially if they're a new patient, you really don't know until you go through some basic questions. But first I want to share a story. Yesterday I uh, competed in a bike race in St. George, Utah. It's a 105 mile bike race called the Fall Tour uh, of Southern Utah. And it's 105 miles through a really challenging but beautiful um, ups and downs and through different parts of the valley and the canyons. And uh, I did it once three years ago. And my goal was to beat my previous time, which I was able to do. But, um, you know, it took some training. And more importantly, I actually trained probably not as hard or not quite as frequent, but I just trained smarter. And there was this sign on the race that I saw and it said, don't limit your challenges, but instead challenge your limits. And I think that's a great thing we can do as leaders and as practice owners to carry that message to our team and do it through servant leadership and through inspiring our teams rather than by micromanaging and just telling them what to do. And I've found that my place is really as a leader, not as a manager. I'm really not a great manager. I'm great at jumping in and doing things by example, and that can go good or bad. You know, you can also do things the wrong way or following the wrong process or not having a process by example too, and that can confuse the team. But I love the challenge of just being able to push myself to be able to do something like this. And I've been reading, um, listening mostly to some different books by John Wooden who's uh, the most successful college basketball coach ever, maybe the most successful of any kind of coach ever, just based on not only the number of championships he was able to win with UCLA, but the values and the life lessons he was able to teach his players. And he talks a lot about how his goal wasn't to make his players basketball players. His goal was to make them great people. And he talks about how the process – and the activity is often more important than the result or winning the game or the score. And I think that's a great thing to remember that dentistry is not just about collections and production. 
it's important to measure those, which I'm a big fan of, but it's more important to think about what's the purpose of what I'm doing? What's the impact that I'm making? How am I helping my team become better people? And that might even mean that some of them are going to leave because they're going to elevate themselves and their standards to a new high. And there may no longer be a place for them in your practice, but that's okay because it, that creates such a great culture and such a great environment that it goes a lot further. One of our core values is continuous learning and improvement as a team. And so each week we want to take time to reflect on what worked and what didn't work and continually improve on that and doing it in a positive way so that we're not making anyone feel bad about what they didn't do or did do. So talking about the right fit versus the wrong fit patients. This is something I've thought a lot about over the past couple of years because we break down patients into what we call pawns. So a pond is simply a group of patients that can identify by a common condition, a common diagnosis, a common way they found us, a common way that they uh, were referred to us, a common um, thing they may have like overdue for recare. We just call those pawns or groups, right? Sometimes in marketing, they'll refer to that as list segmentation. So the value of this is you don't want to send a blanket message. A lot of these uh, dental softwares that I've used over the years or so-called marketing experts, they'll give you this message and it's kind of like, oh yeah, if you have an opening, send a message to all your patients texting them for $50 off a dental procedure or we have an opening today. And in my experience, and in most practice owners that I've met, I can promise you there's not a whole bunch of people just sitting by their phone thinking, I don't have much to do today, but if my doctor or dentist called, I would love to move my appointment up, right? Now, if you segment that or if you create some ponds, you may have a pond of people who are in pain or they're in some type of temporary appliance or they're looking forward to get getting their final um device delivered, right, or retainer or something like that, those people may be interested in moving up. For the most part, people don't generally think that way. And so you have to create a message that's catered to them. And sometimes that's just a conversation starter. But the best way to avoid this is to filter out people who are just simply not a right fit for your practice. And this is not being discriminatory in the way of uh, thinking you're better than someone else or you don't have time for someone Okay, what it's doing is you're saying no to people who are not a good fit so you can have a stronger yes to people who are the right fit. This is where I think we can do better as a profession because so many practices get in this corporate mindset of we have to have everybody as a patient and we have to have a big brand and we have to have everybody in the community come see us and that's just not true, right? If you're comprehensive, and you really treat people well, you can do far more with fewer patients than just trying to be more surface level or superficial with a bunch of patients. And when you think about corporate dentistry and private equity, not that it's a bad thing. You know, if you're thinking about doing it, I think you should do your due diligence and look into it, right? I've looked into it, um, not because I ever listed my practice for sale, but because I wanted to understand how it worked and to look at it and say, hey, is this something that in the future might be of interest to me? And so I learned a lot. And there's some good things about it too. But the bad thing, I think, for our patients is most of them have a model of they want to own the practice for five to ten years, uh, get as much revenue as they can, and then they're going to flip that up to a bigger private equity group. And so it's really not about people. It's about how much can we milk from insurance and how much can we get in co-pays and then send that patient somewhere else? And so if you do the opposite of that, that's your way to stand out. So a right fit patient, uh, there's kind of six things to look for when you're thinking about a right fit patient. And uh, these six things I'll run through and then I'll talk about four reasons to refer. But when you think about the current dental market, um, over the past few years, I looked up some statistics. And in 2021, 
the insurance, dental insurance specifically, dental insurance growth was 22.4%. So that's almost a quarter of growth in dental insurance. Now, conversely, that same year, dental practice growth was about 6% on average, right? Which means some practices grew much more and some grew much less. But if you average that out, you can quickly do some math and figure out that there's a discrepancy there of, you know, 16 to 14 to 18%, right? So where's that 14 to 18% going? I don't think it's too hard to figure out who's getting that money, which is the insurance companies. And so when I talk about these six, think about it as creating a member or a guest in your practice rather than a patient. Because a patient is something that legally, when we see someone in our office or treat them, we have to finish that procedure or refer them to a specialist and close out working with that patient in the right way, right? That's seeing a patient. That's just our ethical responsibility of wearing the white coat and maintaining an honorable state license and those kind of things. But when you have a guest or a member, that's even better because now you have someone who you're building a long-term relationship with. So the first of the six is if a patient has no commitment to their health, right? And I'm not talking about someone who says, hey, I know I haven't been to the dentist for six years. Okay, but this is someone who maybe hasn't been to the dentist for six years, but they're also not brushing, they're not flossing. They think that all the odds are against them and that they have no hope and that the reason their teeth have a thousand holes in them is because their mom didn't take them to the dentist or something, right? There are exceptions to that, of course, okay? Just one to be careful of. Okay, the second one is they're not willing to write a check, okay? Or they might act like it's no issue to pay, but then they fight your treatment coordinator, they fight your office manager, or they leave you bad review because there was a balance due after their insurance paid, right? A third one is a free consult hopper, okay? Now, we discontinued free consults in my practice a few years ago simply to filter these kind of people out because the people who want something for free for the most part have no intention to pay now every market's different so you got to test your market out and test your marketing because you may have really good success with free consults but we found that a free consult attracted people who were going to get a free consult somewhere else so we have a minimal fee for them to come in as a first patient right and we collect that over the phone before the first visit and that takes some practice and implementation. But what that does is it filters out people who weren't going to do it. Because a lot of times people will call and say, oh, I don't have any money, or I don't get paid for a month, or I don't like to pay over the phone. Okay, and all these excuses that you think about, well, when you reserve a hotel, you pay over the phone or you pay online, right? And you know, you're given some assurance, hey, if you cancel it within this time period, you can get a, a refund. And we do the same thing. So for someone to say, hey, a local community business I don't trust more than a large hotel chain is telling about what that person's really looking for and what their intentions are. So watch out for the console hoppers. That's the third one. The fourth one is comparing multiple offices for basic care. Now, if I were going to make a purchase of 10000 or 20000 or $70,000 on my health, I would very likely get a few consultations, right? But what I'm talking about is they're calling around for the cheapest cleaning, the cheapest tooth extraction, the cheapest composite filling, all right? You want to stay away from those people because for the most part, that's all they're going to look for. They're not going to keep their recare. It kind of goes back to number one. They're not going to be committed to recares and health, right? So we, we treat a lot of people who feel bad because they haven't been to the dentist for two years, five years, some even 12 years, right? We can tell that they're putting some effort in, they're owning up to it, and we don't make them feel bad, and we just compliment them and say, hey, it's great that you're here. But when someone does that and they're not really doing anything on their own, and they're not committed to improving their home health, you're going to have a very big boulder to push uphill with that person, right? Often they may need some type of counseling or therapy or other treatment first before they're ready to take on dental care. So if they're if they're 
you know, just looking for the cheapest, whatever. First thing I do is talk to them and ask them, well, tell me more about what you're looking for. Because sometimes you find out that they're just scared or they've had some bad experiences or they felt like no one was transparent at their office and they got ripped off. And that might open a different type of conversation where you can find out that the question they're asking on the surface about how much is X is really because they're just trying to figure out how working with a dentist works, right? But if that's all they care about, probably in the wrong kind of pond and good good patient, maybe good patient not to see because it's going to take away with all the backlash you're going to deal with from a really great patient you have. Or they might hear that person yelling in your office and you have a really great patient sitting in the chair and now they're getting anxious or they're wondering what happened and they start to doubt or question. The fifth one is if someone just questions all of your diagnosis, okay? Now, I'm not talking about them questioning how urgent this is or how important, but if they say, yeah, I know this; these teeth have all these problems, but can we do a little bit of time? That's totally cool with me. But when they say, oh, well, no, I don't think that's it. Or, well, I talked to another dentist and he said that, right? Or, oh, it's been that way for 30 years. And that's just how the tooth was born. Okay, so if they're questioning that, first thing you got to do is make sure you got good records, which goes beyond just x-rays, in my opinion. But just finding out a little bit more about them, because if they're just going to question everything you do, again, you're never going to get anywhere. And then when you get into the money discussion, it's just going to pour fuel on the fire. The sixth one is they only want to do what insurance covers. Right, that's a red flag to me because you can't really get someone healthy by only doing what insurance covers. Now, again, there can be situations where maybe they are going through financial hardship, right? Or they just had a family member pass away, or they just got married, or they just got divorced. So, you want to be sensitive to those subjects, right? But even just acknowledging it and walking them through it, and maybe you scale back treatment temporarily, that's totally fine. But if they're not going to do anything or commit to anything, you're never going to get anywhere. So use these six as kind of broad brush strokes across what to look for. But in 80 to 90% of the cases, we take this pretty literal and say, these are some non-negotiables in our office, right? And that's not because I think that that I'm better than someone else, or I think that they're not good enough to be a patient in our office. That's just simply saying for the way our practice is built and structured, for you to get progress and momentum, these are some non-negotiables. If these don't work for you, let's talk about some other options. Or let's talk about maybe someone would be a better fit. And we refer patients there all the time. I have a corporate uh, style dental office right next door to mine. And I refer patients there. If all they want to do is what insurance covers and they don't want to commit to anything, and they're just looking for the bare bone cheapest thing. And I think they're appreciative of it because that feeds into what they're trying to do. So don't be too quick to judge, right? We're here to be empathetic and understanding of patients, but also stick to your core values and stick to who you are. In dentistry, you know, we have some groups like the American Dental Association and some local groups, and these groups are never going to help you be successful, right? Their goal is to ensure that you have a job and that dentistry is a profession, but their goal is not to ensure you are successful as a practice owner or that you can increase your profit each year or that you can have the best team around, right? Some of the things they do support that, and I'm not saying they're against those things, but they're like the governing body, right? It's like the government. The government's never gonna ensure you're super successful, right? They're gonna provide some basic services, basic protection, And the government does some things that are very important that we all have and we appreciate. Same thing with the American Dental Association. But don't ever assume they're going to help you be successful or figure all these things out because they're just simply too big, right? There's a political element in there that they have to have as a governing body. And that the the bigger the group gets, the less they're going to be targeted towards you. Kind of like the reverse of the ponds I mentioned earlier. You just have this big giant pond and you treat everybody the same, the message starts to get watered down. So you divide them up. Now, the four horsemen 
Okay, these are these are when I will refer a patient. And often this is on the first visit. Okay. So this is where we tighten it down a little bit. Those other six probably involve some discussion. And those are just some principles. But these four horsemen is when we refer. The first one is the patient blames all other dentists for their problems. Oh, I've never been able to find a good dentist. Oh yeah, I saw this dentist and he drilled into the tooth and then he broke it. Or he did a root canal and he cracked the tooth. Or he put a cap on it and it just kept falling off, right? And then they tell you, proceed to tell you how two or three other dentists were the problem too. Well, if this isn't news to you already, you're just gonna be the next problem, the next pebble in their shoe. So beware of those and that's where we have a discussion with them. We'll do an evaluation and we'll kind of say, hey, look, based on your needs, I think you'd be better served by seeing this dentist who treats these kind of cases, right? And sometimes I'll refer a patient like that to a prosthodontist or some type of other specialist, or if it's a cost issue, okay, maybe like to a DSO, okay? So blaming all dentists, that's the first one, okay? The second one is their cosmetic nightmare, meaning they're picky, yet they don't take great care of them, their teeth, and they're just going to scrutinize your work and tell you it doesn't look right, and they're going to come in for 75 adjustments, right? And this is just through discussion of, you know, for me, typically it's, I look at their teeth and everything looks great, and they want to change some things that don't make a lot of sense. To me, that's a cosmetic nightmare. Not, it's not so much the challenge of the treatment. Or, the, or how we're going to bond the teeth or those kind of things. It's the patient's expectations if they're looking for something that doesn't exist. The third one is they break appointments or payment plans. Okay, so if the patient cannot keep appointments, they can't keep payment plans, they're always calling the last minute rescheduling, we give them one freebie, right? But on the second one, they're charged a missed appointment fee or a canceled appointment fee, depending on which type it is. All right. And then sometimes we just say we got to refer these patients out. So if I have a, a patient who is a chronic appointment breaker, we will archive their chart and we'll put a special note on there that says to be seen again, they need approval from Dr. Williams. And that's just so the team members don't just keep booking that patient because sometimes they'll just keep calling back. Right. And they'll just go, oh, yeah, let me just check with Dr. Williams and see. OK. And then we just opens up the right avenue to have a conversation with that patient. Because if I just have a team member get on the phone and go, oh, we can't see you anymore, you broke too many appointments, okay? That's not gonna go over well. And it's not the best way to treat somebody. And so we talk about it and we rehearse it backstage so we can have a good delivery that's positive to the patient and find a way to help them even if we can't be the way to help them, okay? So look at these four horsemen. Okay, um, cosmetic nightmare, blaming other dentists, break appointments, or break payment plans. And if that's something that you're finding uh, constantly, then I would refer that person out, right? Now, sometimes the, um, you know, the, the other aspect to this four horsemen is they don't accept any kind of treatment, okay? Now, you have to be careful we asterisk that one. If that's the only reason, then we don't just instantly refer them because sometimes it's actually a symptom of a bigger issue such as dental fear, or dental anxiety, which is a real thing, keeps a lot of people awake at night. And so if that's the case, then we step back and say, hey, let's let's uh you know talk about this and see what their pain points are, what their hot buttons are, and see if we may be able to help. So if that's the only one, we talk them through it, and a lot of times we can help these people out. But if they have two or more, uh, if they have that and one other, or any of the other standalone, then usually it's a reason to refer the patient. So make sure in your software, you're marking when people actually miss or cancel appointments. In the, in the early days, we would just simply delete their appointment when they didn't come or didn't show up. But make sure you're marking it because it is part of the medical legal record, but it also provides a way for you to track when and why they canceled, make some notes on it in their chart. It's just good practice, good record keeping. And then that way you can make more 
of an objective decision than a subjective decision. So I hope this has been helpful today. Um, please send your comments or feedback. You can email me if you'd like a copy of the pre-qualifier positioner tool. It's uh, T Williams at yourpracticegrowth.com or text me 801-513-8911. Dr. Tyler Williams, love to hear from you. Get some feedback. We don't have a bunch of fancy funnels and marketing websites and these kind of things. Cause I think those sometimes can be too gimmicky or too much of a sales pitch, or you're going to end up on some list. You're going to get a thousand emails from us in one day. We're not into that kind of thing. We just enjoy helping other practice owners like you succeed and grow and not get overly influenced by all of the crazy changes going on in our profession today. And uh, I'd love to hear your stories. Please, uh, leave your comments on iTunes. Love to hear about it or on whatever um, podcast network you listen to. And thanks for listening to this episode. Look forward to catching you on the next one. Have a great day. For more tools and tips on how to create an X Factor membership practice, visit yourpracticegrowth.com and subscribe to our free weekly email today.